As has become tradition here on Welcome to the Basement, we record this episode before the Oscars air and it is released after the Oscars. But that's not going to stop us from talking about the big show. And congratulating the winners. We're so confident we know who the winners are going to be. We guarantee we will be 100% accurate. And so we'd like to start off by congratulating the Best Picture winner right here. That's right. Took home the gold. For Best Supporting Actress, her. It's great that they're finally supporting women at the Oscars. Best Supporting Actor, boy, I was torn. Would it be him? Would it be him? It was him! That was a surprise. For Best Actor, him. Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. How do you like that, Leonardo DiCaprio? That award could have also gone to Johnny Actor here, who I thought did a fine job. Another award for this guy. Hey, look at what Star Wars won. Well, I'm happy that Mad Max won this. Cecil, who won for best song? That's right. Yeah, even the cat knows. And for best foreign film, Son of Saul. Good job, movie. Well, the Oscars sure were fun this year, or at least I assume they will be. Right? Actually, I, I think I'm busy that night. Oh. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. In the past years, for our post-Oscar show, we have watched movies that have been nominated for or have won Academy Awards. But tonight's movie didn't just win any Academy Award. It won the big one. Best Picture. We have never had a Best Picture winner on this show. There are many Best Picture winners that are about exotic locations, exciting people, and historic events. But sometimes, they're just about regular Joe Blows. Like Marty. Marty! Get over here, you lug! Released in 1955, starring Ernest Borgnine and Betsy Blair, Marty was written by Oscar-winning Hollywood scribe and Welcome to the Basement alumnus, Patty Chayefsky. Oh! Marty won the top Oscar gold over such films as Mr. Roberts and The Rose Tattoo. It won three other Oscar statuettes that year, including Best Actor for Ernest Borgnine, who beat Frank Sinatra for his performance in The Man with the Golden Arm, ah. which, which we watched on this show, episode 51. Marty also won the top honors at the Cannes Film Festival. The only other film to win both of these top awards was The Lost Weekend, a movie about a man and a bat. <coughs> the weird thing is, I've never seen this movie, but I have seen Marty. I watched the TV version, which was part of the Philco Television Playhouse series. It came out two years before this, was also written by Chayefsky and directed by the same director, Delbert Mann. It was such a successful broadcast that it immediately got greenlit to be made into a Hollywood movie. But starring Rod Steiger, I believe. That's right. So you've never seen this before? I have not, no. Probably wouldn't under your own recognizance. I, well, actually, I have held it in my hands at the video store a number of times. It's also the shortest best picture movie ever. Hey, we'll be able to close early. Yeah, head out to the bars. When you're a working stiff like good old Marty, sometimes the simplest pleasures in life are the most valuable ones. Uh oh. Oh, it is a yo-yo. This is, uh, of course, an ancient Chinese weapon. Hey, get up off that stoop and come on over to the old leather couch where we're going to be watching the best picture winning movie called Marty. Here we go, Marty. If you've ever wondered what the living face of Stu looks like, I think you're about to find out. Marty, we have to go back to 1955 and accept your, your Oscars. <laughs> Marty Poletti is a butcher, and all the ladies in the butcher shop want to know why he's 34 years old and not married yet. You're breaking your mother's heart. What's the matter with you? That's a no way. Gotta you no respect. <laughs> Marty does not have a satisfactory answer. After work, he goes to his local bar and meets up with his friend Angie. Marty, why do you go to those funny bars in the Chelsea district where only men hang out? It's Saturday night, and they need to figure out what they're going to do. What do you feel like doing tonight? But they have a little trouble deciding. I don't know, Angie. What do you feel like doing? 
What about uh, laser tag? How about calling up that big girl we picked up in the movies about a month ago? Big Earl? Yeah, he's fun to hang out with. You know, that big girl that was sitting in front of us. Oh, big girl. No, I don't want to get married. I'd rather hang out with big Earl. Ange wants to call up some ladies and go out on some dates. I feel like calling up to see a Mary Feeney. And making love all night long. But Marty is sick of all that. He's tired of being rejected. And they just don't like him. Meanwhile, back at the house, Thomas and Virginia are talking to Marty's mother, Teresa. <laughs> mother Teresa. They were having a problem at their house because Tommy's mom, Aunt Katerina, she lives there. Katerina's always getting up in Virginia's business. And she got me so nervous I spilled the milk I was making for the baby. I said, Mama, Mama, you want to see me really spill some milk? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I must say she's an older goat. Maybe Tommy's mother could come here and live with you and Marty. Well, oh, I don't want her on my back about the milk. <laughs> Marty's mother says it's okay with me, but you need to check with the Marty first. They ask Marty if she can move in, and he says, no problem. Well, Virginia was in the kitchen making milk for the baby, and my mother comes in and... Tommy, I promised the babysitter six o'clock. I'm just tell I'm telling the milk story. It's a good story. <laughs> Marty wants to have a chat with Thomas about the butcher shop he works at because the guy who owns it wants to sell it to Marty and Marty's not sure if he should buy it. Thomas says, we'll talk later. Was it almost midnight already? Time for me to transform into a goat creature. Oh my God, I forgot. <laughs> Marty thinks about what Angie said before about this gal, Mary Feeney. He decides to call her up and ask her out on a date. This phone call goes wrong in epic manner. She does not remember him. Once she does remember him, she does not like remembering him. It's bad and it's sad. Marty has dinner with mom and she says, hey. Why don't you go to the Stardust Ballroom? What? I, I say, why don't you go to the Stardust Ballroom? Is no, mom, I can't understand a word. Your accent is too thick. I know I've been living with you my whole life, but I just, I'm not getting a word. Just tone it down. Tone it down. You can meet a nice girl there. Marty blows up. And a fat, ugly man. You not ugly. I'm ugly, I'm ugly, I'm ugly. Marty. Ma, leave me alone. Ma, you just have to accept it. I'm not gonna meet a nice girl because I'm fat and I'm ugly. But he and Angie decide to go to the Stardust anyway. The Stardust Ballroom presents Rejection for Marty. Marty tries to ask a girl to dance. She's not having it. Meanwhile, Clara arrives with a fella who's really not interested in hanging out with her. He doesn't think she's attractive enough. He approaches Marty and says, Hey, I'll give you five bucks if you take this girl off my hands so I can go with this other girl who is more hotsy totsy. Marty's like, No, that's not what you're supposed to do. Clara gets jilted by her bow. She goes out to the balcony. Marty comes lumbering to the rescue. Oh, would you care to dance? She cries. So this is dancing. <laughs> I don't really see what the big deal is. I didn't expect it to be this wet. And they end up dancing together. You're not such a dog as you think you are. Well, I wouldn't call myself a dog. Well, you're a very nice guy. I don't know why some girl hasn't grabbed you off long ago. Grabbed you off? <laughs> <laughs> Ma, do you gotta go to the Stardust. You get the grabbed off. Yes. Ma goes to Thomas and Virginia's apartment. She has a little sit-down conference with her sister. How you feel? I got a pain on my left side and my leg dropped like a drum. Uh, it's a curse to be old. It's a curse to be old. I would much rather have died when I was a baby. Some sort of a crib death. You know who else died? Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, he had a pain in his side. Mama levels with Katerina. They say things are no good in this house. And so I'm an old garbage bag put in the street, huh? Well, you dress that way. <laughs> Someday, Marty will find a wife and then you'll be alone. Marty and Clara have left the ballroom and let me tell you, they are hitting it off. Marty is so excited, he just can't stop talking. It's like he like has a mental block in his head that has made him forget how to stop with the mouth movements. I have a cousin who's a teacher. He teaches Latin. He lives in Chicago. He was studying to be a priest, but he gave it up after his first vows. <laughs> Boy, my head's getting all funny. I feel all lightheaded. I think I'm going to pass out. Bye. <laughs> Old man died December 1937. Two o'clock in the morning he died. I was there. I was holding the pillow over his face. You got a real nice face, you know? Really a nice face. Very undog-like. They go to a cafe and they just sit there for hours talking. They love it. Everything's great. I'm Catholic. Are you Catholic? I'm a Rosicrucian. 
later on on the street. Somebody suggested that I buy a car, but I'm terrified of cars. I'm just the opposite. Me and my car, I feel safest of all. I can lock all the doors. It's the only way to live. In cars? Yeah. Hey, Marty! Hey, Marty! Ralph shows up in a car. He's got an extra gal, and he wants to know if Marty wants to come with. It's a sure thing, Marty. I'm with a girl, Ralph. Get rid of her. There's some money in the bank. Don't do it, Marty. Marty, I will go back in time and kill you if you get in that car. <laughs> I will kill you, Marty. I can't do it. And he goes back to Clara. And why don't we just stop at my house? I can get a little money. I'll take the bus out to Brooklyn with you. I'll make sure you get home safe. Which, as any New Yorker will tell you, is a huge commitment to make. Good job, Marty. She's got a real Village of the Damned look to her. <laughs> Marty tries to get a goodnight kiss, and Clara's not having it. Marty's like, oh, rejected again. Fine, you're like all the others, and he gets all upset. But later, Clara says that she was just nervous, and she didn't know what to do, and she really wants to see Marty again, and she really likes him. I'll call you up tomorrow. Maybe we'll go see a movie. Can it be one of those dirty Times Square movies? And as they're about to go, they do kiss. Marty yes. <laughs> Marty's mother comes home. Oh, who's this? A woman in the house. We got us some chicken in the icebox. No, thank you, Mrs. Paletti. Well, we were just going. Take us some chicken with you. Just put it in your pocket. It'll be, it'll be the pocket chicken later on. <laughs> it's that curse that my sister gave me finally paying off. Oh, come, sit down. What is a mother's life about her children? Marty, does your mother have <laughs> subtitles? <laughs> Finally, Angie finds Marty as he's about to take Clara home, and he says, what's the deal? You ditched me. Marty says, this is my friend Clara, and Angie's like, who cares? Marty takes Clara all the way back to Brooklyn, drops her off on her doorstep. Good night. Good night. Second base, good night. <laughs> Marty is out on the street, and he's, he's happy for himself. He's so happy, he beats up a sign. And then he goes running through the street like a Gene Kelly that doesn't know how to dance. <laughs> the next morning, he's, he's getting ready for church. He's washing his face. Will you please go outside because i got to put on my clothes. All right, so what are you getting so sore about? I don't want you to see me in the, the nude. Thomas and Virginia are fighting. Thomas is upset that his mother is upset. And he's wondering why Virginia and her can't just get along. Katerina is brought over to the house. The new retirement home for old ladies. The martyr. She's always got to be the big martyr. Please, uh, go to mass, huh? Where you can learn about the real big martyr. You're sure getting fat, you know that? Yeah, you're bigger than like a lamb now. <laughs> Pretty soon you'll be a fat, ugly a man like me. Marty tries to tell him about this business opportunity. Don't do it. Stay single. Don't have any attachments. Marty's mother also tells him, ah, I don't know if I like your little friend. She doesn't want him to see Clara anymore. She doesn't like her. Marty, I want to talk to you. I don't want to talk right now, huh? Marty, I made a graph to show you why you shouldn't date that girl. Marty's buddies come by and they're hanging out. I don't like this girl you're hanging out with. She's a dog. Marty, you don't want to hang around with dogs. It gives you a bad reputation. Because you had such a great romantic reputation to begin with. You should just hang out with your male friends. You know, the way I figure, a guy ought to marry a girl 20 years younger than he is. So that when he's 40, she's still a real pretty doll at 21. It's views like this that ensure that I will die alone. Marty's supposed to call Clara at 2.30, but he keeps getting all of these negative vibes off of everyone that he knows. So he doesn't call her. He hangs out with his buddies, Angie and these other two goons. And suddenly he snaps. What am I, crazy or something? I got something good here. I'm going to call Clara. See you later, Angie. Marty out. What happened? Hey Marty! Hey Marty! Hey Marty! What happened with you? Hey Marty! You must have a name! Must have a name! That fat ugly man scored himself half a dog. One of the things about this movie that's a little unrealistic is that neither of them are really that unattractive. Do you believe it when you're watching it? I think so. You really don't need any convincing about the attractiveness of Werner Sporkman during that telephone conversation. <laughs> yeah, right. The guy may as well have looked like a big vat of raw sewage. And then you're watching and you're like, man, I love that vat of raw sewage. Sure. I want that raw sewage to, to find a, a, a rat. Yeah. 
Well, if you look at some of the current TV shows, Crazy Eyes on Orange is the New Black, mm -hmm. Brienne of Tarth on Game of Thrones, you know, these are supposed to be very unusual looking people, but you see them in red carpet photos and you're like, well, these are just beautiful women. Yeah. You can do a lot with makeup. And acting. It's very unfussy camera work. It just sort of is there and it, allows, it shoots what it needs to shoot and it lingers where it needs to linger. And it really gives you the feeling that you're sitting in the room watching these things happen. Most importantly, it makes you feel like you're wandering the streets of 1950s New York City, which yes. looks like a hell of a lot of fun. Knowing how long a shot should be, like how long we look at Marty standing next to that sign. Yeah. As he's just sitting there and being happy. And it's and kind of welling just, up in him. Yeah, yeah, and so when he finally punches the sign, you're like, yes! You're punching it with him. It seemed like this movie had kind of an emotional impact on you. I saw you kind of reacting in ways that I don't normally see over there on the old other couch. Yeah. You seem to be getting very nervous for Marty's ultimate fate. It's the 50s, and that's when they started thinking we can have unhappy endings. Oh, yeah. And I did not want this to go down that road. If you want the audience to be happiest, you get them in a really low spot, and then... Right. Just a little uptick is suddenly, boom, it's, you know, the ending of Cinderella. In the first half hour of this movie, you go through that. You get him telling his mother that he's always going to be single and she should just accept it. 30 minutes in, he meets Clara, and it's perfect. We have an hour left of this movie. It can't just be them being happy. Right. It's just going to be Marty messing this up somehow. And the only thing that kept me going other than the fact that I'm not going to like get up and leave, I have a job to do, it was the fact that I knew that people loved Marty so much when it was on TV that they made a movie out of it. It's yeah. like, has to have a happy ending. And also, it's like she wasn't that ugly. Yeah, and right. And even if she was ugly, it doesn't matter. He loved her. Like, right off the bat, he loved her. Sure, sure. So yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting a little... Getting a little, little, little. <laughs> There's also little ticks that Marty does. The point when he yells at his mom over the dinner table and he sits down and he like pats her her arm twice. That's just a wonderful bit of realism, which I don't think that a, just a few years earlier would have appeared in a movie. Right. Because they still had the very stagey True. way of talking and acting before then. And now that you have a real human being in a movie, you touch people like you normally do. <laughs> and you talk like a normal human being. <laughs> what do you want to do tonight, Craig? I don't know. What do you want to do? I want to visit our website. Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. There are all the episodes that we have ever produced available there for your hungry little eyes. And there's a PayPal donation button. If you like our show, you can throw a few dollars our way. We like dollars as much as the next guy. You can make a one-time donation or a rolling monthly donation, just as Sarah, Emily, Kyle, Joe, and Robert have done. Thanks, guys. And... Ladies, if you'd like to find out who the rest of our donors are and find out the exciting contents of our mailbag, check out Welcome to the Basement Unboxing this Friday. It is a curse. It is a curse to have seen it. Seen it, ma? With the Oscars a dim glow in our memories, we are going to take one last look at 2015 and movies that were not nominated for Oscars, but perhaps should have been. T.A. Epley writes, The End of the Tour. Seen it. Seen it. This is the story of David Foster Wallace and his book tour for Infinite Jest. This story takes place back in the 90s. And boy, does it ever. Did, what, how was it going back to the 90s? Smoking inside sure. constantly, you know, like houses a mess. It was... S like so many of my friends' houses. House is a mess? That's a 90s thing? No, but just My the, house is filthy, and it's yeah, 2016. Yeah, just the specificity of everything. I wish there were more movies written about authors. Also, I just really like how they captured uh, the Midwest in winter. Just the weird, lonely beauty of the flat landscapes. Victor Hugo Alvarez writes, Spectre, what a huge disappointment. It's just the same cliche formula of all 007 movies, a repeating pattern of events that doesn't offer something new. Seen it. You know what part about this movie I liked? When he, like, shoots at things and when he goes to exotic locations. You haven't seen this movie, have you? No. Yet, I think possibly you have. It should be noted that this movie actually was nominated for an Oscar for Best Song, but, you know, that doesn't really count in the <laughs> narrative of the film. I think I was also disappointed with Spectre, and I have a question for you. Should there be new James Bond movies? Wasn't Skyfall the final one, the point where the James Bond franchise came full circle? That maybe should have been the final Daniel Craig James Bond, and then they just reboot it all over again. So you think that the James Bond franchise is still vital in today's world? It's vital because people pay to see the movies. Yeah, but I'm talking about artistically. I really don't look upon that series 
as being these great works of art. But isn't any movie a work of art? I mean, it could be a good work of art, a bad work of art, a lofty one, a schlocky one, but it's still, it's all, it's all art. So you didn't like it. Why didn't you like it? I did not like it. I just watched it, and then five minutes later, after leaving the theater, it's just gone. Like, left no impression. I couldn't tell you one thing that happened in that movie. I couldn't tell you one thing. Oh, uh, Christoph Waltz is in it. The Scary Nymph writes, Have you seen the documentary The Wolf Pack? It's about these brothers who have lived isolated from society all their lives. Brilliant movie about coming of age and the universal love and power of cinema. Seen it. Seen it. I was surprised that this was not uh, nominated for Best Documentary, but not disappointed because I wasn't that crazy about the movie. The movie didn't give me any more than what the trailer gave me. After the film was over, I still didn't know why these kids weren't allowed to go outside. I didn't really know the situation. I didn't know when they started to regularly go outside. It was all just very unclear. I know that when you're making a documentary, you kind of just get the footage you can and you create the story that you can. And I feel like this filmmaker didn't get enough. But then there's this weird nebulous, it's like, well, when did the documentary people show up yeah, to start filming? Exactly. I like those kids. I like their story. I didn't like the movie. I like the movie. I think everyone should give it a chance, particularly if you like movies. Nicole Foster writes, Love and Mercy should have been up for Best Picture. Seen it. Seen it. This is a biopic of Brian Wilson in two very distinct phases of his life. I thought Paul Dano was outstanding. He was Brian Wilson, as far as I was concerned. I thought John Cusack was really good, but the problem with that section of the movie was I was watching it and saying... That is John Cusack up on screen. He is playing Brian Wilson. Couldn't get past... He has such a distinct face and a voice that he was not able to disappear into that character like Paul Dano was. Well, and also, we were so much raised with John Cusack, and Cusack always did play John Cusack roles. And I know you're a huge fan of music biopics, but really, they all follow a formula. And the fact that they were telling two stories overlapping each other yeah. made it so much fresher. So you're watching the fall of Brian Wilson while you're watching the rise of Brian Wilson at the same time. Yes, and Paul Giamatti playing another rock and roll Svengali. Yeah, I know. Just like he did in Straight Outta Compton. Oh, oh you know, I'm just trying to help. I'm, I'm really concerned about what's yeah, happening that's... here because, because I, think you're, I think you're really doing the wrong thing. My little rap friend, my little surfer boyfriend... <laughs> Well, that's seen it. And that's our show. We watched Marty. Yeah, we did. 1955's Best Picture. Wonderful. If Loved you, it. If you haven't seen it, look at it, for God's sake, on your television or your, your screen. Our next episode is March 18th, just in time for my birthday on March 24th. Don't believe Wikipedia. That's the wrong date they have up there. If only there was some way you could fix that. I'm sure there is a way, but I haven't figured out what it is yet. Okay. It is customary on one's birthday to receive gifts. Oh, crap. I would like you to give me the gift of a movie. Oh. We've known each other for years. You know my likes, my dislikes. You know what thrills me. You know what bores me. I would like you to select a movie for our show that you think I'm going to love. It should have at least three things about it that you feel would appeal to me personally. And of course, it must be a movie that you've never seen. Of course. So are you up to the challenge? I am always up to the challenge. All right. Tune in next time. You'll see what gift Craig brings me. And of course, by proxy to all of you. Good night. Good night. Check it out. Look at you. Look how skilled you are. Mm-hmm. I never knew you were so yo-yo adept. It's because I didn't have girlfriends. Okay, now we can go. <laughs> hey, Marty! Hey, Marty!